And this is a powerful signal that Australia is taking its responsibilities as a real member of the G20. I mean, our economy today is probably, today, bigger than that of Russia. We've got responsibilities coming from that, a bit like Spider-Man. You know, <laughs> with, with great power goes r- great responsibility. <laughs> but we've got to step up to that. Have one for Mum, one for Dad and one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. Budgets are about choices, Fran, and you show what you value through the choices you make. Dead, buried, cremated. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't treasurer. be scared. Don't the treasurer you. knows. Australia is basically done for. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy. You know, a banana republic. How good is Australia? Just follow the money. G'day. And welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast that explains the big economic issues in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute, and today we are going to talk about the climate and the Pacific. Specifically, we're going to examine Labor's idea to bid for the 2024 COP in partnership with the Pacific. The United Nations Conference of the Parties, also known as COPS, are the supreme decision-making body of the Framework Convention on Climate Change. The COP meets every year, unless parties decide otherwise, and the first COP meeting was held in Berlin all the way back in 1995, and the most recent one was in Glasgow. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to COP. Welcome to Glasgow. The eyes of the world have been on Paris for weeks to mitigate our emissions and to move towards a clean energy economy, no matter what happens here in Copenhagen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the third session of the Conference of the Parties of Japan. Our climate system may well be taking an irreversible path unless we act now. COP26 is our last chance to avoid the worst effects of climate change. It is the last best chance the world has to come together. Our addiction to fossil fuels is pushing humanity to the brink. 1.5 is what we need to survive. Two degrees is a death sentence. So we've outlined a comprehensive Pacific plan. It's about increased aid. It's about dealing with climate change, including hosting a COP along with the Pacific Island nations. To unpack this idea and what it will mean for climate policy and for Australia's engagement with the Pacific, I'm joined by Richie Merzian, Director of the Australia Institute's Climate and Energy Program. G'day, Richie. Hey, Eb. And Alan Beam, Director of our International and Security Affairs Program. G'day, Alan. G'day, Eb. Richie, I'll start with you. Has Australia ever hosted a COP before? Why would it, why would it be a good idea? Uh, no. In the 30-year history of the UN Framework Convention, Australia has always avoided taking on this responsibility, it would be a great idea because Australia is basically a handbrake on global climate action. It has a reputation as a laggard. It won the colossal fossil in (laughs) Glasgow for doing the most to do the least. Uh, And it would go some way to repairing that reputation if Australia takes on the responsibility, expands its interests to actually doing something more than just promoting fossil fuels. And Alan, uh, in recent times, Australia's relationship with the Pacific um, has been tense, shall we say. How would this go in terms of helping to potentially mend our relationship with the Pacific? Oh, it would be a very important start, Eb. Uh, We need to do a lot to mend our relationships in the Pacific. For many of the countries of the Pacific, though, Australia is the place which is best positioned to do something about the climate peril in which they all live. And so to have a co-host from the Pacific for this COP would be fantastic. And it really is a huge problem for Pacific Island nations, in particular climate change. It's often at the very top of their list of security issues, so it's an incredibly important one for the Pacific. Oh, it's vitally important for most of them, uh, and indeed for all of them it's vitally important because not only are they confronting uh, rises in sea levels, which they're existential threats to a number of those countries. But the changes in weather patterns, the changes in ocean salinity, the the changes in um, ocean acidity as well, these are having enormous impacts on fish stocks, on the coral reefs, which in turn have impacts on the economies, the tourism economies of all of the Pacific countries. So climate for them is a really dire threat. 
And the more that they're able to participate, but the more they're able to persuade the very big emitters, of which Australia is one, the better they will be, and frankly, the better Australia will be as well. Mm. There is no dignity to a slow and painful death. You might as well bomb our islands instead of making us suffer only to witness our slow and fateful demise. So you are concerned about your saving your economies or your uh, situation in Australia. I'm concerned about saving my people. Richie, how big is a COP? What are we talking here in terms of scale if Australia were to be successful with a Pacific Island partner? A COP is the largest UN event outside of headquarters in New York. And so it's a major undertaking for a COP like this, which wouldn't necessarily have lots of the world leaders come like Glasgow, but would still be a decent sized meeting. You're looking at up to 20,000 people, which has major economic benefits to the city that hosts this because that's going directly to the sector's hardest hit during the pandemic, like tourism and hospitality. So it's a big event, but not massive like a G20 or a Commonwealth Games or Olympics, which Australia has you know, very quickly put its hand up to host in the past. And very successfully in a lot of cases. That's right. <laughs> and, and again, with Brisbane in 2032. <laughs> yeah, coming down the pipeline. Um, Alan, to be successful in its bid to host COP29, the Australian government would need to probably significantly scale up its diplomatic resources and its engagement with the UN and the Pacific. What does that look like in the past and how big of a challenge would that be in itself? Well, it's a very big challenge, Eb. First of all, Labor's got to win the election for this to have any hope of working at all. So that's the first hurdle. Yeah. After that, Labor's got to take it very seriously. Um, the setup is very expensive and it requires not only the provision of enormous resources across so many sectors just to host it, but it also requires enormous investment in policy development, uh, in the diplomacy necessary to ensure that we get as many players to attend such a conference as we possibly can. And more than that then, to start persuading people into really seriously positive and constructive actions that are going to have the net effect of reducing the global carbon burden. Now, if we're going to host it, we've got to be up the front as a leader too. So that requires not only changes in policy, but changes in practice. Um, Once upon a time, we were well set up for that. We had legislated a carbon price. But over the last decade or so, um, not only have we merited the fossil of the day or the colossal fossil, but we would be well on the way to the fossil of the century. (laughs) And uh, so I think that there's a lot of work and a lot of investment that's got to be put into the hosting of this conference. I just want to stick with the diplomatic efforts that would be required at this point. You and I in the past have spoken a lot about how Mm. Australia needs to reinvest in diplomacy in particular. Would hosting something like this really be an opportunity to kickstart that reinvestment in diplomacy? And what kind of benefits would you see down the track if we did it right? Well, look, of course, it's a, it, it's the, the golden opportunity to kickstart our diplomacy in the Pacific um, and in Southeast Asia. I mean, we've We can't forget that archipelagic Southeast Asia is also subject to enormous long-term impacts of climate change. So our, our diplomacy in the Pacific and in Southeast Asia are both of them capable of enormous expansion if we take this seriously. I'd add to that, though, that if you look at the the damage, frankly, that has been done to our longer-term relationships in the Pacific, something like this will go an enormous distance to repairing that damage. And as part of our diplomacy, we've got to make sure that we are not only investing in our diplomacy, but we're investing in the diplomacy of the Pacific countries themselves. So this then stretches across not just into what we do, but how we use development assistance funding principally in making sure that Pacific countries have got the capacities and the capabilities to represent their interests and also to be able to represent them effectively in a group of countries which are very practised in being able to push back. So it's a very big task for all of us down this end of the world. Mm. 
The Tongan Prime Minister has been reduced to tears as Scott Morrison battled to ensure a statement from the Pacific Island Forum did not include a coal ban. Australia on its own won't cool the climate and if we're serious about it we've got to actually understand that emissions don't have a nationality. Richie, we've seen in the past, uh, I'm thinking very specifically about Glasgow, which was delayed due to the pandemic. But uh, to Alan's point about Australia would need to be showing leadership around climate policy, you know, the UK seemed to do a lot and put a huge effort into making sure that COP was successful. Um, It led a lot of talk around keeping coal in the ground and that type of thing. What would some of the changes be required or the ambition that other countries would be looking to if Australia were to host? The first thing the UK did was put climate at the top of their diplomacy. So that was they, they put a number of senior officials there. Australia would need to resume with its previous position of ambassador for climate change. It would need to scale up its missions, its, its diplomatic missions to have teams working on climate there. Um, and then on top of that, in terms of policy, it would need to re-engage with the international climate architecture. So, for example, the UN's key financing mechanism, the Green Climate Fund, Australia is not a member there. Prime Minister Morrison pulled Australia out of that fund on an Alan Jones interview on a whim to the surprise of Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Australia helped set it up, actually, when, when Alan was working with Minister Combe. Australia helped co-chair. Australia even led the fund. And now Australia is nowhere to be seen. That was a key opportunity for Australia to reconnect with the Pacific. Australia even co-hosted a meeting of the Green Climate Fund in Samoa, a great model for how it could co-host a COP with the Pacific. So rejoining some of those pieces is key. And then also improving what we need to do on the domestic side. That has to start with fossil fuels. You can't escape the fact that Australia is the third largest exporter of fossil fuels. We know the Pacific have constantly called for a moratorium, a halt on new coal mines, that would be the first place to begin improving our domestic policy as well. Mm. And as you've said, this is kind of uh, an idea that's come from Labor, should it become, uh, should it be elected. A conference of the parties meeting, a COP meeting here in Australia, which an Albanese Labor government will bid to host here in Australia, to send the message to the world that Australia's under new management when it comes to climate, but also to sell Australia's economic opportunities. Glasgow has just shown how far we are being left behind by the world. You know, our trade relations, we will face carbon tariffs into the future because, you know, the economy is moving on, the rest of the world is moving on. The the government has dropped the ball on the Pacific right now. And during this period, we haven't even had serious visits from the Foreign Minister or the Defence Minister, Sir de Solomons. Uh, does Labor have in mind a specific Pacific island? How would they work out who we might partner with? So um, it doesn't seem like they have a specific Pacific country <laughs> just yet. Sorry to make you say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's good practice. Um, the When Minister Bowen or Shadow Minister Chris Bowen was on our uh, ministerial climate debate, he basically flagged that it would be whichever Pacific country was interested in doing it. So it's a good sign that we'll, in a sense, be led by the interest that exists in the region to partner with Australia because Australia is playing catch up. This has always been an existential threat in the region and it hasn't been shared by Australia and now we're trying to turn things around. Samoa has always been a good partner on this front. Fiji could as well. We know that Prime Minister Bani Marama constantly chastises Australia for its <laughs> climate position. Maybe he could also partner up, although Fiji hosted a COP a few years ago as well. There's different options. I think the most forward-leaning would be looking to do something with the Solomons, if that is possible under this current administration, but who knows? Mm. Alan, coming back to you, we have often talked about climate change in terms of its security implications, and I know that's on the minds of a lot of people given the security pact announced between the Solomons and China. How important is it for Australia to really... I feel like at the moment we look at climate change in terms of, you know, the costs to the economy. It's always very negative, but it has very serious security implications for Australia and the Pacific as well. Um, How important is it to have that lens over our engagement on climate? In the longer term, it's critically important because one of the consequences and a real consequence of climate change and global warming, let's call it for what it is, is the dislocation of peoples within their own countries. 
Um, and if you look at a country like Indonesia, for example, or Papua New Guinea, where you have growing populations but subject to all sorts of pressures on land use and on ocean use, the potential for real societal disruption is real uh, and growing. Now, that's where the consequences become largely immeasurable. They can be forestalled and prevented, but only if you start now. And you can imagine what a mopping up of major social dislocation in a place like Myanmar, uh, the Philippines or or Indonesia. These are all archipelagic states uh, with big river uh, deltas in in the case of uh, Myanmar. Then you've got to start now. Mm. And I think that the consequences uh, across the globe of uncontrolled climate change are in fact catastrophic. Mm. So the security consequences of inaction are deeply profound and they're right up there with the consequences of nuclear exchange and unmanaged pandemics. It is that serious. Yeah. Richie, uh, if this were to go ahead, Alan's kind of talked about the scale of the diplomatic uh, effort that would be required, but Australia obviously is coming off the back of a decade where the coalition has very much struggled in government to achieve a couple of different climate policies being enacted and we're really seeing, I guess, a huge task ahead of us to achieve our commitments under the the climate convention. I mean, how important would this be just as, uh, I guess, a restart in the event that we do have a, a, a Labor government coming out of the election? It would be significant. It reminds me of Kevin 07 where... The key ask there on the international front was to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. It's that kind of a shift. Uh, As um, Chris Bowen said, it shows that Australia is under new management. It's a very different persona and plan that Australia is putting forward. And we have to remember that over the last three years, Australia's reputation has sunk even further on the climate front. Like Prime Minister Morrison uh, was disinvited from Boris Johnson's climate summit in late 2020. He didn't attend a UN climate summit despite being in the United States where it was being hosted. So Australia has a lot of making up to do, and this is a sign that that a new leaf, a new page is being turned. Mm. Obviously, there's um, a decent chance that the coalition could be re-elected uh, at, on election day, despite what the polls say. So I guess has the the current federal government uh, responded to this idea. Do they see any merit in it, Richie? Uh, No, unfortunately not. Uh, The Minister for Emissions Reduction said it would be a waste of money. It could be otherwise spent uh, probably propping up fossil fuels, I guess, (laughs) uh, given alongside that he also announced more money for gas. So unfortunately this isn't shared across both parties. But I have seen um, other candidates and, uh, and, and political players come in to back this. Mm. I think this would be a refreshing change in Australia's approach. Um, and in addition, it is the kind of energy that you don't often see on climate in Australia. It has been, as you said, in that negative space for so long. This is actually trying to showcase what we can do because climate can be positive. It can be an economic renewable. And we're starting to see this bubble up. This would be a way of bringing the world to Australia rather than Australia trying to shirk responsibilities and events globally. And just sticking with um, a potential coalition government being re-elected, when it comes to climate policy, obviously they've um, dismissed this idea of hosting a a COP, but they do have uh, other climate policies on offer. We have talked a lot about the extent of fossil fuel subsidies, for example, but what is the coalition aiming to do, for example, with um, programs like UNGI, Underwriting New Generation Investment and and other things. What's the alternative here that we're looking at? The current federal government seems to be fixated on keeping coal and gas in the electricity system. So that is both sweating out the existing assets for as long as possible and also funding new gas power stations. We saw this with Curry Curry and now we're seeing this with other smaller grants, including through the Underwriting New Generation Investment Program. Alongside that, we're seeing additional funding for solutions that also rely on fossil fuels. So that's clean hydrogen, again, using fossil fuels to make hydrogen a really dirty process. 
um, as well as investing in fossil fuels being used for other things as well. Hmm. So it's still, it's really just more of the same. And obviously there's a potential that we could see um, a whole bunch of independents potentially elected to the crossbench at this election. Richie, um, a lot of them are running on platforms of climate action. Have any of them responded to this idea of hosting a, a COP? So the independent candidate here in the ACT, David Pocock, has, has said that, that this is a great idea and it would be great for Canberra to host this as the capital. <laughs> um, I think what we'll end up seeing is a bit of a bidding war for which Australian cities should host this. It's a great economic and touristic opportunity, um, but it's also good to showcase what you can do. You'd think a place like Canberra that's net 100% renewable electricity or a place like Adelaide with the grid there moving very quickly to 100% renewables, great opportunity to showcase what can be done as well as all the other industries alongside it. Look, I think that the whole idea of hosting COP29 would do an enormous amount, not only to restore our position in the Pacific and in Southeast Asia, but globally. Um, Australia's turned itself into an isolated sort of country over the last decade or so, and that seriously needs to be fixed because all of the other things that are going on, uh, the the rise and rise of China and our inability to deal with that, the war in the Ukraine, uh, the changing situation of Russia globally, uh, potential changes in US leadership over the, the next electoral period. Australia has got to be back on the world stage. And this is a powerful signal that Australia is taking its responsibilities as a real member of the G20. I mean, our economy today is probably, today, bigger than that of Russia. We've got responsibilities coming from that, a bit like Spider-Man. You know, <laughs> with, with great power goes r great responsibility. <laughs> but we've got to step up to that. And this is a really signal opportunity for Australia to get back on, on the stage and start playing the constructive role for which, in the previous 60 years, we had a really fabulous reputation. So this is important. Richie? It also starts on day one, assuming Labor does win in some form. In addition to building up DFAT, there's the G7, which Germany is hosting, and Germany has said that it wants to turn the G7 into a climate club and make climate a top priority, and hopefully Australia will be invited there and can begin. Alongside that, later this year, Indonesia, our neighbour, will be hosting the G20. Again, another opportunity to demonstrate that Australia has turned a leaf on its diplomacy and is engaging with the region in, in a fresh way. So that begins straight away. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. This episode was recorded on Tuesday, the 10th of May, and things may have changed since recording. You can visit australiainstitute.org.au for all our latest research and content, and we're on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. My Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T. Richie Merzian is at Richie Merzian, and Alan Beam is at Miranda Process. This episode was produced by Jennifer Macy and you can find her at Jennifer Macy with additional editing by Louise Osborne. Our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum with additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. Don't forget to leave us a review if you enjoy the podcast because it helps other people to find us. Stay safe out there and thanks for listening. Bye.